Yeah, I mean, it was it was really powerful and it led to the protests, definitely. And we actually, that footage got turned into, it went to the Oscars, actually, it won an Oscar. There's, wow. um, there's a, a documentary called Burma VJ. So that it was, it was the footage from that. So hello and welcome to Power to Speak, the podcast. And today I am so, so happy and excited to have with me Lucy Griffiths. Hello, Lucy. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's so so lovely to see you here. I have to say, and I will go into all of this. That the 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 reason that I've been stalking you for the last two years, um, we will talk all about that. But Lucy, you're a best-selling author of uh, "Make Money While You Sleep." I have to say, which I'm 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 halfway through, I think, and really really enjoying it. We'll get onto that later. But best-selling author as well as a, a, a business and life coach, an online course creator coach, and yeah, very, very successful online course creator yourself. And quite interestingly, a former TV journalist. And in that capacity, you've been all over the world. So do you mind if we start there? Tell us a little bit about how you got into journalism. How did all of that kind of kick off? Sure. Um, so I always, you know, from school days, I loved, I, I always, you know, was involved with the school magazine and always, um, even as a child, I think I would, you know, make little magazines or books. And I remember I used to spend hours in front of the mirror, kind of pretending I was on Blue Peter and you know, <laughs> just doing, making things and kind of talking it through. So I, I never had a fear of kind of um, TV or being on camera or um, or um, being in front of the mic as a child. Um, I certainly, as I got older, I, you know, I did things like hospital radio. And then I think sort of fear and doubt started to set in in, in my, maybe at university. And, um, and I think a lot of that was around um maybe putting on weight and just kind of you know you just start having those maybe you're just more conscious of yourself and and com your confidence tends to dip and um so I worked in radio for a long time and I loved I loved radio I still love radio and I made the most incredible friends and we just it was the best place to work it really was um but I also, I, I just found myself, although I, I absolutely loved who I work with and radio is so much fun, um, but I was spending hours kind of, I just remember one day standing, I was standing in a field at some kind of pop concert and there was Atomic Kitten and they were literally having a fight in the toilet. And, um, and I was trying to sort this out and get them on stage and I remember thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> Just thinking, I don't want to do this. And so that was the little seed. I think that was like August time. And I basically decided that I was going to quit my job and go traveling and work out what I wanted to do. And I had spent most of my younger years living abroad so my mum and dad literally when I was 10 months old they packed up four kids and drove us across Europe with a trailer tent <laughs> attached to a tiny car and we moved to Berlin and we lived in Berlin and then we lived in Cyprus and we lived in um in the US and we lived in Hong Kong and we just kind of lived a very um my dad worked for the foreign office and we just always moved every kind of four years we moved and we moved somewhere and um and so I just had that sort of instinct that I wanted to go and travel and I, I just felt like I, I was I was feeling stifled um and I very much have that if I I I will get I sort of have to move every few years or change jobs I, I still have that 
we weren't in the army, but kind of that kind of military moving mentality. And, um, and so I was feeling stifled, I think professionally and everything. And I just, so I decided that I wanted, I'd read this book called, um, it was Dunkirk to Delhi by Bicycle by um, Dervla Murphy. And it was basically about this woman who in 1963 cycles across Europe and then then to, to Delhi. And I'd read this book as a teenager and was like, oh my goodness, I want to do that. So I just set off and I basically used, you know, cycled. I used, I didn't use a plane. I just used trains and um sailboats and crewed on yachts and I travel around the world um and it took me about two years um but in that time I freelanced in various places and so I worked as a journalist um I sort of freelanced a bit um in China I was teaching in China and then SARS happened and I kind of made the most of that and um I um you, you know you as in not made the most of it. Let me rephrase that. I um, SARS happened, so I was able to report on that, and that was that was a real eye opener as to the reality and what was being said, and just how I felt suppressed, and I, I realized that other people were, and that really got me thinking. And then I I ended up in Burma, and. Um, Burma was, you know, it's such a beautiful country. The people are so lovely, Myanmar as it's now called. And, um, but there is terrible persecution of, of many uh, uh, di different ethnicities. And I met women who, I met a woman who told me that her daughter had been basically the army soldiers had come to the village. They were not. Uh, they were not Burmese. They were different. They were Karen, and um, they army soldiers had come to the village and attacked all the men, taken all the men away, and then they used the women as um, sex slaves. And they had put her daughter in a pit, and you know, basically raped her multiple times, and then put a snake up her vagina to kill her. Mm. and um and I heard so many different stories of accounts like this and um of just just terrible atrocities that were happening of villages being burned down and people fleeing and so I ended up spending a long time on the border working with refugees in a refugee camp in northern Thailand and we started putting together um just teaching people how to shoot video, use microphones to record interviews, to, to basically fund a, create a, um, their own news outlet so that news could get out because people starved of information. And people loved uh, the BBC Burmese service, but, you know, they wanted more. And so, um, so we started, um, teaching people to, to film. And that really was, um, was a, a starting point for me for, um, you know, very much um, both working internationally in, in international news um, within a kind of TV environment. I was working for lots of different news agencies, you know, both BBC, but also um, American networks. Um, and um, like, uh, you know, uh, AP and um, Reuters and um, ABC and um, NBC and um, and that was um, you know that was that gave me that opportunity to kind of um, you know so I was working with um, Burmese people and and that was um, that was the starting point really for me of getting into international news but I was very much really advocacy based and um, so we set up this network and um and basically they were filming material and they would send it to me and we were able to in 2008 there was a protest and it was led by a nun walking down the street and she it was literally one woman and i remember ringing um the news desk 
in New York and saying, oh, there's this woman walking down the street and it's a protest. And they were like, why do we care about this? It's just one woman. I said, no, this is really significant. And basically it grew. And within a month, that was like the 19th of August. And by the 19th of September, there were 100,000 people on the street protesting. Um, and, you know, those moments um, were, you know, were, were huge for me, like, like just of a greater purpose and mission than just, you know, atomic kitten having fights in the toilet. And, um, you know, so I was very much led by human rights journalism. And I, so I then was asked to move to China and I didn't really want to do it. I, this is kind of 2008 and I was pretty burned out of journalism. And I was, I, 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 you know, covered a lot of different conflicts, protests, you know, whether it was like earthquakes in Pakistan or, um, you know, flooding or protests in the Philippines or, you know, just the nonstop. And then, of course, the tsunami with 2004, all of that was pretty intense living in Thailand in that period. And so they'd asked me to move to, Berlin, to Beijing and I didn't really want to go. And I was like, do I go? Do I not go? And I went to India. Um, and so I was working in India for a bit. And um, and I remember doing a story with Amma, who's like a hugging saint who, well, she's not a saint. She's just kind of this, I guess, um, somebody who she channels, she's like a deity and thousands of people go and worship her. And um, anyway, I was doing a story on her and literally a hundred thousand people there at this, you know, big event to see her. And, and, and they said, Oh, you can ask Amma anything you want. And I said, should I go to Beijing? And Amma said, go to Beijing and work with the Tibetans. And I thought, Oh, okay. And so off I went to Beijing. And that was literally the reason that I went. That's, I mean, I it's, I mean there's, there's so much in there. I, I mean, just mind blowing. <laughs> Absolutely mind blowing. So, so you, so you did train in, in journalism at uni? Yes. That's yes. What, so I'd done, a, I'd done a master's in journalism. Yeah. And so you were sort of crossing Europe with that sort of background. So as you, as you were crossing Europe on your, on your bicycle, which is, did you say on bicycle? You were just on yeah, on so it was land. bike, yeah. and then and then bits of train. So, so basically, I went across Russia by train. I didn't cycle because right. I was yeah. just scared to go by. a long way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but also, but, it was by that point, it was it was cold. It was so yeah. it was, you know, it was like minus yeah. twenty, yeah. minus forty in yeah. Siberia, and you know, so yeah, um, because most of us, most of us sort of sit at home watching this stuff on the news. And and not even thinking about the those people that are reporting, you know. I I I've watched the news, um, and it was Myanmar actually. Was it last year? I think last summer when the, when all the there was sort of rioting going on and the, the sort of overthrow. And I can remember one journalist standing there, literally with all this stuff going on behind her, and she was trying to walk backwards into you know. And it's like we could see what she was walking into. Um, so you, you, yeah, you take your life into your hands, but also, is there a, is there a part of it that you almost become um, numb to to the horrors that that are going on around you? Because you know, you you sound like you were right in amongst it, talking to people that had been going through some really quite horrific. Um, yeah, you definitely get more. You, it's not that you you care less because you don't. You get. You, you're so you're so in that world so immersed in that world and you and you really do care because you wouldn't it's you know really when someone phones you up and says can you go to Fukushima for three weeks there's been a you know a nuclear there's been an earthquake in Japan can you go for you know and you literally you're sleeping in a car and you know you're it's you know it's very intense and you don't know what you're going to get your into you know in that case it was like you know it was nuclear it was earthquake it was everything um so um you can it, it, it's very it can be very challenging that you're so immersed in it you're kind of just in that world and so caught up in it um but but it is easy to get burned out because it's so draining mm. and um for a lot of my friends who are in that world or were in that world, um, you know, I think they would, they would, 
you know, come back and like people c come back to Beijing or whatever. And then we'd, you'd sort of, you'd have downtime, but then people would go absolutely nuts and just go crazy drinking. And, you know, so it was, it was very hedonistic and very, so it was lots of roller coasters, you know, intense. Yeah. yeah. You'd be in Afghanistan for kind of six weeks on an embed and that was exhausting and full on. And then, you know, then you just, I let go and you just go crazy and so there was there was lots of definitely lots of kind of intense emotion but also it you know it's you have to unwind and so for me that was definitely you know I, there was a lots of drinking and partying and it was fun it was it was great fun as well um but you are dealing with the the rawest of human emotion as well yes yeah yeah, I can imagine. And obviously, in those sort of situations, you haven't got a family around you. You haven't got that sort of support system. You're you're kind of thrust into these areas, you know. And and it it must be very well, very hard to keep any kind of relationship going or or have that kind of family support system around. Yeah, you, I, you know, I I didn't I didn't really have relationship. I, you know, I had sort of relationships with cameramen, or you know, they were just kind of not. They weren't. It was it was a very different world. Yeah. Um, but I got to a point where, you know, 10 years ago, I was just like, I, I was like, okay, I, I need to change. Like, you know, I, I'm sort of, as much as I loved that world and I did, and it was incredible, the adventures and the things that I got to do. Um, and the experiences, you know, I, I, some of them I, you know, you, you forget how many you've had. And somebody will remind you of something. You go, oh, yeah, of course, we did that, like something really crazy. And um, but you get to a point where I wanted to have a bit more stability. I wanted um, to have a family. And you can't, well, you can combine those things. And I have friends who you know, they have a couple of nannies and they go, they have kids and they do still get on a plane and go and report. But I didn't want that for my child. So um, I made a very conscious decision that I was going to walk away from that world. Yeah. And was that was that after China? Was that you went and spent some time in China? So so I was in China for five years and that was very, very intense. Um, you know, it's it's, I was running a um, team of, I had a team of journalists and, um, you know, you are constantly being followed, hacked, your team, you know, if they're doing stories that are not pleasing the Chinese authorities, you are, you know, it's very, very difficult reporting. Um, and I think since I've left things have got much, much worse. We also set up the first Western news agency in North Korea. So we were going into North Korea a lot. Um, and, you know, all of that is is quite intense. You have minders, you, you know, everything, it, it, what you say, you're tracked, you're probably home is bugged. Um, and, you know, you have burner phones to go and do stories that are sensitive stories. You speak in code you you know it, it it's even in the office you kind of had whispers and we go out for a walk with somebody you know you you kind of you can't um you know you you behave in a different way to to kind of you know I, I, and sometimes I see people sort of thinking that somehow their life is very repressed and I think you have no idea what repression really is mm -hmm. um you know and, and in North Korea it's on a totally different level again like in China it's very sophisticated whereas in North Korea I guess it's more more sophisticated these days but certainly 10 years ago you know mobile phones were a rarity and it was it was um a very very different experience and yes. and also tough because in the winter it's kind of minus 40 and cold and while there's heating in in you know the main rooms or whatever it's still really really cold and if you go to the toilet there's you know and if the toilet's overflowing, it's a skating rink on the floor because they're not heated. And, you know, it's... it's um, so were they, were they, uh, that you were allowed into North Korea? How, how did... 
Because um, I assumed you were, no, that nobody, especially reporters, weren't allowed. So I had a colleague who is the most incredible colleague who um, basically navigated the Korean authorities by, he was just nice to them. I mean, he was nice to everyone, but he would take them out for dinners and he built up a trust with them and developed relationships with them over, over many, many years. And from that, we were able to go and report. And then from that, they realized that there was, you know, there was also a business opportunity for them. And um, so we were able to establish the first bureau in North Korea. And um, so we trained some North Korean journalists and they came to Beijing for training. They uh, We took them to London for training. and. Um, you know, it was very much that we had to get permission to do the stories and we, everything was planned, what we could do. But we were still able to report from North Korea and set mm -hmm. up and that opened the doors for other organisations to have bureaus in North Korea, you know, CNN or Reuters as well. And um, so, yeah, so that was a huge moment. Um, and but it's exhausting going to North Korea for a, a week, a month is quite an intense experience you know you're yeah. you have a minder you're followed everywhere you have a very specific itinerary you can't go off piece you can't just like say oh I'm going for a walk you can't do that um if you get period pains it's challenging yeah. <laughs> so you know things like that it's it was always difficult so I mean, yeah it's incredible that you you could get that far did you manage to talk to any of the actual um residents any of the you know any yeah any, but, any but, but then, you know yes they would set up stories and we'd go and you could go and do vox pops in the street so talk to people but you know everybody and the same with china everybody knows that they are being monitored and there is no way they're going to say anything that is you know in some way disrespectful or whatever um mm -hmm. i remember it didn't happen to me but to a colleague of mine he was saying goodbye to someone one of his minders and the minder said i hope next time i meet you in the free world and you know and and, and we never saw him again afterwards and um you know so we don't know if he was taken away or whether he managed to escape because there were you know these kind of human trains they were called where american christian groups would help north koreans get to the so they get to the border they'd swim across the river into china and then these human trains would basically help them um secretly escape through china down to vietnam and then down to cambodia and then fly to south korea from there yeah and claim asylum so yeah it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? I, I mean, just the the stories that you've you've got. You do need to write a, a book on on that. And I I don't know if that's on your on you know on your list on your to do list is to write all this down. Um. Yeah, I think I will at some point. It's just, I always I always think my stories are never as interesting because I I know so many people who have much better stories than me. So I therefore think, oh no, but you know, so-and-so is much more interesting than oh, me. Oh, no, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, even going back to um, what you were saying in, um, in in Myanmar, in Burma, about giving them the equipment and the knowledge and the skills to actually film their own stories and have that opportunity to actually share what's going on with the people around them. I mean, and that is, that's an incredible story in itself. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really powerful and it led to the protests definitely and we actually that footage got turned into it went to the oscars actually it won an oscar there's wow. um there's a, a documentary called burma vj and so that it was it was the footage from that um and yeah so really really incredible yeah. um and you know so brave because you know they would shoot be shooting things that as in filming video not shooting killing no. um you know but they would be f filming events you know the army carrying out atrocities um that were you know if they were found they would be sent to prison i mean um i um i 
went into the country one time and I ended up, I don't know if I, yeah, I didn't have mentioned this. So I ended up being put in prison um, and I was lucky enough to get out um, by the sheer fact. So I'd gone in on an Irish passport and that helped. Um, and they were convinced I was a spy, but I think my Irish passport and I managed to kind of like, you know, basically they, I, so what I did was, was they were, they thought I was a British spy, but I, um, so by going in on my Irish passport and, um, talking about my Irish roots, that was, <laughs> I just kind of got myself out. The Irish can go anywhere. <laughs> I've got Irish roots myself. Yeah. Smile so, and off you go. So, but you know, I was in prison for like 48 hours, but I, you know, I had to very vociferously, um, you know, talk about the, you know, the things that the British had done in, in order to get myself out of prison. It worked. Um, but, you know, the, the women who were being held, who were political prisoners and many journalists as well. And, you know, they were so sweet and kind to me. You know, they gave me and I, you know, because I sort of went in there and I didn't have supplies, but they their families could bring them water or food. And because obviously you can't drink the you can't drink the tap water it's um so and you know so they they were very very generous and sweet to me and you know they'd been in prison you know some of them for kind of 14 years for things that they'd reported on or said and you know so yeah it was um it's, it's so incredibly dangerous to be a journalist these days I mean you just and, and that brings me on to the fact that you worked with Al Jazeera I mean, I I actually I love watching Al Jazeera news actually because it kind of it gives you a worldwide view rather than you know sort of the the homegrown journalism that we have, but you do get to see how difficult it is to to rep report and how dangerous it is to report on some of this stuff. You know. Yeah, I mean, um, Al Jazeera was incredibly brave, particularly. Um, they're sort of they they want to be a voice for the voiceless and so that was a real and uh, and the thing with Al Jazeera it has money so it was a real luxury for me to be able to kind of report on stories that I really wanted to tell um and so yeah so I got to work you know across Asia across across the Middle East um and um yeah, so that was that was a you know really wonderful experience. Um, after China, I sort of went back to London, and then someone offered me a job in to go to set up a TV station in Iraq, and um, and that's and then from there I went to work for Al Jazeera. So yeah, it was um, I was always um, I I always I've always been about um, wanting to tell stories that make a difference. And, um, and that was, you know, a huge, that was one thing that I loved about Al Jazeera that they, um, they always have that mission. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some incredible stories out there and, and, you know, from my background and, and loving to tell stories too, from an acting point of view, from a director point of view, just the overview of, of seeing what, what, what motivates people to do what they do, you know, and, and from your viewpoint as a journalist, you, you've seen people have to make some, be motivated to do some really, some incredible things. So yeah, that whole storytelling element is, is so important and giving people the opportunity to tell their own stories, I think is, is so important. So important. But I suppose that kind of leads us on if we can <laughs> move slightly <laughs> over to, um, to to what you're up to now, which there, I mean, there is a lot of storytelling. You, I, I receive your newsletter, or I receive an email from you practically every day that that's that's telling your story, and you are very open on on social media about who you are, what you've been through, why you're doing what you do. How do, how do you? because lots of people that I work with when I'm when I'm working with them to find those stories what makes what makes you do what you're doing why are you passionate about the business that you've built if you've got to step on a stage and speak about what it is that you do why do you, you know why should your audience care so I, I kind of deal with that that side of people and I try to draw those stories out of them and lots of people don't like to be that vulnerable they don't like to or a bit like you and the journalist stories they don't feel their story 
is as good as the next person's. They don't feel that they have something to say that's worth listening to. So how do you feel about putting those stories out there and, and opening up to your sort of social media following? Oh, goodness. When I first started, I, I could write kind of thoughtful, inspiring pieces, but it wasn't very personal. I wasn't very um, vulnerable because... I was so used to, I was so used to, I, I could write international news and that was kind of, you know, and I could write inspiring, um, possibly slightly bland, let's say, um, but there wasn't any vulnerability in there. And I didn't know how to share that vulnerability. And that took, I think it's, I think it's a muscle. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. And um, in the beginning, when you first start out in business and, you know, people expect you to write social media posts and then kind of share things about yourself, it's really tough. But the more you do it, the more you exercise that muscle, the easier it gets. And, um, you know, whether that is showing up on video um, or whether that is, um, uh, you know, writing a blog post or or writing a post for Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever. Um, and, you know, it just, the more you do it, the less you kind of, you just get a bit more blasé about it and a bit more just, oh, effort, let's do it. And, you know, and so I think, you just your capacity to to share those stories it's easier um and from that there are always boundaries there are boundaries about the conversations that you want to have so i don't you know i've gone through quite a difficult divorce in the past year and i will talk about how i feel about it and my emotions but i don't talk about the specifics of it because that could get me into trouble. So I'm um, so I'm very careful with what I share. I will talk about my son, I will talk about our relationship, the plans that we have, but I don't talk about my wider family. And um, there was a definite moment, my son is autistic and, I, and there was a definite moment of, do I talk about his autism? Because that's his story to tell. Um, but actually, um, I think that it is hard to be a parent of an autistic child. It is, there are lots of challenges, particularly in getting diagnosis, all of those things. And so I think it's important to talk about that journey. Yeah. And actually, my son is really proud of his autism. Um, he will very happily tell people that he's autistic if you say it's your superpower, he gets annoyed and he says, no, it's not. It's my brain. Um, <laughs> and so, so, but he is, you know, he knows his, his strengths and he has many with his amazing brain, but he also knows that he needs downtime or, you know, some, gets anxious and some of those other ways that, you know, life impacts him. Um, so I think, telling those stories is it is hard i'm not gonna lie it, it is hard and i remember the first blog post i ever sort of pressed i shared a blog post i'd written to a facebook group and there were some bitchy women in the facebook group and um it was like a walthamstow mums group so it was a like london mums group and and they were really bitchy and i thought and there was a moment I thought, oh, my God, do I want to do this? And I took it away and I kind of and and it really made me question, uh, you know, do I want to do this? But actually, since then, I very rarely I used to get on some of my ads. I get people commenting on like, oh, you're ugly or your teeth aren't right or, you know, some of those things but I very rarely get negativity. And I think I'm very careful to, I, I don't try, I'm not, like some people say, be controversial, stand out, do this. 
And while you can embrace that space of being controversial, and I, I know it probably, it means you might grow faster and you get a bigger audience because you have some kind of, you know, not Trumpian opinion, but you, by, you know, being somebody who's an extreme and polar extreme to someone else and, you know, having that, that it does create friction and that can, you know, grow a massive audience on social media. But for me, I am much more comfortable. I'm not vanilla, but I'm in that space of, I don't want to attack someone. I, I can't be bothered to have, if someone is in my space and they're kind of rude or whatever, it's like they just, I just remove them from my space. Yeah. I can't be bothered to engage with that. I've got enough other fights and challenges going on in my life that I, you know, I don't give that energy. And I don't get involved in anything that is slightly like I remember like the crying CEO on LinkedIn or anything that is kind of polar extremes. I don't give it energy. And so I just attract to me people who are positive, thoughtful, kind. And so I have a really nice experience on social media. Yeah. And I think if you put out that energy, that's what reverberates back to you. And um, it's not, it can be a really nice, kind place, but put out that, that energy of kindness and it will reverberate back. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's, that is exactly what you need to do is just not get involved. If there's people in your space that, that are not on your wavelength and they shouldn't be there and, and get rid of them and, and carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I came across you, it must have been beginning of lockdown, so probably the beginning of the summer 2020, and somebody recommended, because I had been working in venues, doing the workshops that I was doing around voice and acting, um, and everything stopped in lockdown, it was like, well, how do I promote who I am and what I do now? Where, where am I going to um, start or or pivot my business and all, all of those things and somebody recommended your $19 camera uh, confidence on camera course which I bought and so that was when I first became aware of you and what you were doing and then I I came along to a couple of the webinars that you were doing or the five-day challenges that you did in those in those um, dark dark days of <laughs> 2020 <laughs> lockdown yes. we were all in our houses going what the hell am I going to do today <laughs> and I was wearing lots of crazy hats and thinking yeah <laughs> yes. you were I remember it well <laughs> um so how how did that kind of come about because you I, I mean I have to say I I now you, you were one of the people that I thought well if I'm going to start doing video I need to think about what's behind me I need to you know do all of that kind Kind of stuff so you were very instrumental in me you know with the podcasts that I was started doing in September of 2020 uh, about how it looked and how how it was sort of coming across so how did that start for you because obviously that that kicked in before lockdown for you um so when I came back so I was working for Al Jazeera um and my final assignment was covering the conflict in Ukraine in 2014 and um I was pregnant and taking my folic acid and the Russian rebels were pretty frisky <laughs> and um it was really not a pleasant experience um so these are the Russian rebels were kind of what we now call Wagner's army you know they were they were mercenaries they were not pleasant creatures and they had no you know they didn't abide by any codes of war and conflict and so they had no qualms about feeling up a journalist or whatever and it was it was really unpleasant and um I came back thinking I don't want to do this anymore um and the trouble is with journalism you know journalism is dying as a profession and there's, so there's only limited outlets for um, for people in international news. And so you end up doing shift work and they're kind of 14 hour shifts working in a newsroom and you're in a basement, you know, you don't see daylight for sort of 14 hours. And that doesn't really work with a baby. And 
you know, so my my husband, he earned like about five times my day rate. And <laughs> Andy. and um <laughs> You know, so it wasn't really an option to say, okay, you stay home and I'll go to work. Um, and um, and I didn't want to, you know, by the time I'd had, you know, a nursery trying to leave for five o'clock for a pickup was not going to happen or nursery, then nanny. It's like I, I was going to be working for free. And so I just was like, okay, I need to just find, figure out a way to do something different. And so I started out doing did up my flat and um started out doing airbnb so early days early adopter of a airbnb and we did really really well because there wasn't quite so much competition at the time and so quickly had i was you know managing had like nine properties i was managing and um you know and i would <laughs> been trundling poor Ben around London um and we'd go and meet tenant you know guests and um check it be I didn't do the cleaning but check it being cleaned and everything get it all sorted and then um you know and so and then I had we had some properties in Edinburgh and so um we'd go up to Edinburgh and stay with Tim's mum my husband's mum and um would would um, sort out the properties and you know I was always like renovating a property or you know seeing opportunities and um, that you know that that was good and, and that certainly for first two years so that basically was my kind of I, maternity was I was doing that full-time and um, and so that meant I was um, you know managing all of that um well had a you know a little one and sort of navigated both things and I would answer emails on my phone while breastfeeding and um but I and I enjoyed the creativity of making house I love um I love renovation and I love doing up interior design I love like finding things and you know making houses look um look good um and then but I found myself, I was like, okay, I, and I felt a bit stifled and needed a new project. And um, while I was in Iraq um, setting up the TV station, I um, basically did a coaching master's. So this is like 2012, I did the coaching master's. And so, because I would, you do six weeks in Iraq and then two weeks out. And so it worked really well for my studies that I could go and do my studies and then fly back in and you can't go anywhere or do anything. So you study. So it's actually a brilliant place to, to do a master's degree because, um, <laughs> you can't yeah, do not do much else. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's, um, so I had that. And while I was working for Al Jazeera, and I was based in Doha, I used to um, do shift work. So it was four days on, four days off. And so it meant I'd do 12 hour shifts for, for four days, and then I would have four days off. And so, you know, so it'd be a cycle. Sometimes I'd have early shifts or night shifts, but I could then do work and see clients. So I built up my business in that period. And mainly at the time I'd, so from working in Iraq, I was working mainly with people who had PTSD. Um, so it was, I was working with um, Syrian and Iraqi refugees. Um, and I was working with aid workers, a lot of aid workers um, and journalists, uh, you know, and so it was mainly coaching, life coaching. And, um, and so I carried on doing that. And, um, and then once I had my son, I was I, I, I kept it going. I kept, had sort of always had a couple of clients on the side, but my life just it was sort of I was much more moving into kind of mummy circles and 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 it just felt like there was a massive disconnect between the world of PTSD and sort of motherhood and you know and so I thought okay you know am I am I doing you know and started out thinking okay am I doing sort of coaching for mums. But again, it felt like there was a disconnect between the life that I'd had before and, you know, that it wasn't, I didn't have that freedom to be able to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. And, and I think that's really important that if you pigeonhole yourself into a particular thing, a particular niche, then you can't, 
it doesn't give you that breadth and freedom to talk about whatever you want to talk about. And, um, you know, so, you know, with motherhood or even with kind of, you know, when I, I, so I sort of pivoted into helping and I'd done this a lot anyway with helping people being confident on camera. And I'd always had, while doing, uh, while I was on maternity leave, I, you know, a couple of friends would get me to do, a friend in India has a production company in India and she was always asking me to do film production in the UK and go on various shoots. And I had a gig with Man United where I was doing shoots for them as well. So I was always doing that on the side. Um, and And I found myself working a lot with CEOs about, helping them to be confident on camera which I'd done a lot anyway because I'd end up interviewing you know the boss of Unilever or whatever and you you end up having to help people to um to be better on camera you just that's just part of what you do because you want to bring out the best of them in the interview and um I and so it naturally evolved into okay i'm going that's that was what i was going to do it was kind of confidence on camera so i was doing a lot of one to one with people but having long film days again didn't work with childhood you know it was i didn't have fixed days in nursery because my son was always with me and then it was like okay who's going to look after him and that was really the moment of thinking okay well if i create a course and i sell that that will help and i can um magnify what I do and scale but at the same time I'm not actually having to work all of those crazy hours because I've got it here it is and so um so that was my that was really how it kind of came about and um you know so it was it was trial and error, error a lot of it and um I had a client who did Facebook ads and he said well I'll I'll um I'll do your Facebook ads if you like. And um, and I've been helping him with being confident on camera. So I said, okay, great. So um, we, and so at that point, I was selling the course bef before working with him. I was selling the course for, I think, 297 or something. And, um, and, and you know, Rick said to me, why don't, why don't you sell it for 19 and just let's lowball it and see what happens? And yeah, it, and, and it, it sort of, it was one of those things where it just, I remember the first weekend we sold like 170 and I was like, whoa, okay, I think we're onto something. And it just, it just exploded. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously, so that was, we were selling that from kind of 2018 onwards and, um, but lockdown, I think everybody suddenly had to get on camera and it just went wild. And um, while, you know, obviously my Airbnb business was completely decimated and, it, yeah. and that was very scary because um, you're, you're looking at, you know, 10 mortgages and you're just thinking, how the hell are we going to pay 10 mortgages? And, um, but, that $19 course paid the bills, it, you know, which was incredible considering everything that was going on. Yeah. It was really stressful and um, uh, definitely, well, you can look back and think, oh, you know, that, and it was a great achievement. It was so, my, you know, I was so riding a wave of fear and also trying to navigate homeschooling my son, but it was, it was just, <laughs> It was a crazy time. It was really crazy. And um, at the same time, I'd also been approached by various big organizations. And there was me in my spare room at home to uh, do joint ventures of creating courses with them. And um, which was, you know, amazing experience. But also, how on earth do you fit in everything into your day and navigate a five-year-old who desperately wants your attention because he's that's what he wants he just wants mummy and um so it was really exhausting so so you I mean the, the webinars that I saw were obviously after bedtime so how, yeah. how how did you manage that because also at that time I seem to remember you obviously one of those joint ventures was with psychologies magazine yes yes 
so so how did how did you manage that time because lots of people were literally tearing their hair out <laughs> with yeah. homeschooling and running a business my you know I, I my next door neighbor w was doing that and I could hear across the fence you know on on most school days that it was it was not always going well yeah it was um it was really really hard um I would get up at 4 a.m I worked on because I, I had to create the psychologies courses. So I worked from four till seven on the psychologies stuff. And then my son would wake up and he'd watch a bit of TV, have breakfast. So I'd do a bit more work. Luckily, my own business, the courses just sold themselves. So that was kind of making money, selling itself. I had VAs just managing like the comms as far as you know admin. Um, so I'd be writing emails and that kind of thing but but that was you know I could do that anywhere and then um and we were living in London and so we lived really close to Hampstead Heath and um it was you know amazing weather and I would basically take my son out from about nine nine o'clock nine thirty and we'd just go out onto Hampstead Heath and we'd go and look at the ducks and the we'd go and see the ducks and the the swans were having babies and it was it was it actually made the news because there was a swan who was like a widow and she fell in love and you know so it was like lockdown swans it was beautiful anyway so we'd go and see them every day and walk around he'd be on his bike and walk around there we'd and you know because all the playgrounds were closed and he couldn't play with other kids so it was really hard and we'd build dens so it was like a den and we'd go and find so that we called it the fairy hut and I'd hide like little things in the fairy hut of like oh look the fairies have been and you know so we'd kind of and that would take us to and we'd and and you know occasionally there'd be a kind of we'd have the zoom in for a lesson it's got and, and we'd literally do it on the heath and um so we'd be out all morning and and just and I was just kind of with him and very present with him and then um get to lunchtime we'd go back and then my husband would take him out in the afternoon and I'd do a bit more work in the afternoon I tended I might even have a nap because I was exhausted <laughs> and then um you know just be with my son put him to bed and then in the evening I'd have a call um sort of you know and, and then be in bed by 10 and that was yeah. that was how I sort of navigated the day so it was tough. It was really hard. Um, and so I tended to do, like, if I was doing some kind of challenge or something, I'd do it in the evenings. And I, and the reason I had all the hats and kind of silliness was because I was so exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I don't really have anything to say, but if I stick a silly hat on, we can all have a laugh. <laughs> That was basically the logic of it. <laughs> because... It kind of worked. I, I, I stood, stood, was around for an hour. I, I, yes. I zoomed in for an hour. So yeah. No, so no, yeah. No. So that was that was basically the logic of it. <laughs> so then how how did it then move on? Because now, I mean, obviously there is there is the book. You've obviously written the book about creating these courses. Now I have to say, I've got some business books that I've uh, accumulated over the last three years, but this is one of the biggest and it's, it's so, um, what's the word? It's, it's, there's so much information in here. I mean, literally step by step, it takes you through putting, putting a course together. And, and also I've seen you now speaking about what you do. The, the last, I saw you on stage in Birmingham at the digital women live, um, uh, conference there and you are now talking to audiences about online courses and, and making passive income so give me a, a nugget that uh, the listeners can take away about what's the biggest piece of advice that you can give to somebody that wants to make that passive in income where where do they start um I think have a think what you know and sometimes we doubt our own knowledge we 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 take things for granted um but we um we we know we you know our, our experience our wisdom our um skills that we've learned over time and then sharing that how can you share that could you turn that into a course or could you 
use templates, you know, if you're a lawyer or um, you work in HR, um, actually taking that experience and making it into templates so people can buy them. Because what you're doing is you create something and then you're using automation, you're using the power of, um, you know, whether it's social media or Facebook ads or YouTube or wherever it may be to sell again and again. And by doing that, you might be selling for a small amount of money, but incrementally, if you build up, you know, so I mentioned the $19 course, but if you're selling a lot of those, you're selling at scale every single day. So if you're selling a hundred of those a day, you know, that adds up. Or suddenly if you're making a thousand pounds a day, thousand dollars a day, you know, that, what could that buy you? You know, a thousand dollars over a year that becomes, um, you know, that becomes then it's, you know, 365,000. Um, imagine if you were then making 3,000 a day. So that was kind of, you know, so we were making, you know, 3,000 a day at least. And, you know, suddenly, you know, that becomes, you know, when you're having like, a, you know, making 100,000 a month, you know, that is all possible. It's just, it's just mechanics of like a small product, but you're selling at scale. It's got to be the right product. And um, it's got to be something that people really need. And so sometimes you don't always know, but you get that sense of like, is this something that is going to kind of tap into the, sounds like a ridiculous word, but tap into the zeitgeist of where people go, oh, oh, I need that. Or, oh, my son needs that. Or, you know, and you, that and if you if you know you're on to a winner you're on to something then everything else can flow from that yeah and so you took that course that you were selling originally for 297 dollars and bought it right the way down to 19 dollars and that's that's obviously when it took off because it's a no-brainer isn't it it's like you've yes. got all of this value for this sort of quite relatively small amount of money that anybody can afford yes and it's going to get you to that next step Yes, and I said, that's that's what people need to work out is, and I'm working it out myself because you know I'd like to put the the you know speak like a speaker 101 onto an online course, and then that that will be uh, an easy way for people to get to that next stage in what it is that I do. So when you're uh, when you're talking about Facebook ads, because that's something else that a lot of people sort of talk about is 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 it worth it? And how how much how many Facebook ads do you need to do, and how much do you have to spend for it to actually make a difference? So, at the time, and I say at the time, and this is very significant. At the time, um, the iOS changes had not kicked in, so data protection has changed. So Facebook ads aren't as good at targeting people because of data protection as they were a year ago, two years ago, whatever. So at the time you could really target people for what, so you could be very, very targeted with, with their desires, their needs, and you know, what that, what their likes and dislikes were. And so they were incredible at getting, giving you, putting your product in front of an audience that was interested. And so, you know, you could spend, at times we were spending, you know, I started out with like $50 a day, but, you know, built up over time, if you're spending, you know, $500 and you're making five times that income. So if you're spending $500 and making like, you know, two, 3,000 in return, yeah. it's a no brainer. And that was the thing with Facebook. That's why Facebook was so profitable. That's why they made so much money because their ads worked so well that people pumped money into the machine, but they made a lot of money back from the machine. Mm -hmm. And so it was immensely profitable. Facebook ads don't work as well as they did. And so I urge anyone who, Facebook ads do work, but I think you have to, think carefully and so um i do a different strategy now so i very much i so i use organic targeting to to get people into my world and then i retarget them with ads 
And so um, my YouTube channel has always been a big part of my selling courses. And um, so people will be searching for keywords, find my YouTube video, and then I sell from there as well. Yeah, I have to say this is this is your YouTube channel. Yeah. And there are so many videos on there. So, you know, every single um, subject topic that you can imagine on there. So so free resources. So I urge anybody to go and look at Lucy Griffiths on YouTube because there's there's so much value there. So much value. Brilliant. Well, we're just about coming to the end of this fantastic talk. And and yeah, I I got so uh, interested in your journalist. We haven't we haven't touched on the My Course Academy. So you are now teaching as well as the Make Money While You Sleep book. You are running My Course Academy. So so how do people get to know about that? And, and what does what's in the academy that's going to um, help? Um, so it's really a step by step of how to create a course. Um, and and we give you that support to create the course, film the videos, but also then to sell it, which is the bit that so many people struggle with of um, selling it to give you the step-by-step -step framework to sell, to um, create a sales page that actually sells. And I have been through, you know, I've spent a lot of money and I mean a lot, a lot of money working with, you know, amazing people who really know their stuff about sales and selling in the online world to to basically build out a system that sells um and you know so whether that's through the sales page and also then um to give you a webinar system so if you're like me i'm not a natural sales person um it it means that you can kind of create a sales system without you having to be present and sell all the time because you've built a system that sells for you yeah, I mean that. Yeah, please, I'd like one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like one of those uh, because no, lots, lots, and lots of people I know are they, they kind of you talk about sales and everyone goes, Ooh, nobody wants to do it. Nobody. It's one of those. It's one of those things. So within that, within that course, there is the opportunity to to get a template and and look into how you can do that. Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Fabulous. Oh, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to put up here your uh, your website. So again, check out all of Lucy's stuff there, lucygriffiths.com. And uh, you can find out lots more about Lucy. But, but you really do need to write a book, Lucy, on, uh, on all of your travels, because there's some incredible stories in there. So thank you for sharing. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> so what's what what yeah what's on for the rest of your day um i <laughs> this is the thing that actually when you create courses you have a really chilled time <laughs> so um i'll do school pickup at um three and um just have a, a there's very little on so no um, no well, that's great and uh, well i mean what a a fabulous promo for your your passive income book and course because you know that's that's exactly what you've done i have to say before we finish i have to mention when we were in birmingham and you did that uh, the the talk there that that lady, there was a lady from somalia that had had come over i don't know when she she came over to live here and start her business and she was so indebted to you uh, for helping her start her business and uh, I mean do you when you're speaking like that is is this something that you get quite often is that that sort of the questions at the end and and people wanting to thank you for what you've done um I do um I do get people who you know say thank you I know in that particular case um she's she was a journalist and so she was a journalist in Somalia and came here and was like how am I going to make money? And so um, I, I definitely, if I know of refugees who are struggling, that they're always my um, people that I always want to help and support. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, she, Amina, probably got some extra kind of bundles of love along the way, mm -hmm. um, just to keep her going. And you know, once she got herself set up and built her community, she, you know, she's really flourished, and it's brilliant yeah. to see. Yeah. Um, and you know, she's able to. She supported her five kids, and you know, it's amazing how she's built her life. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, one of my big things that I do 
so I have a membership as well and um that funds um through Kiva we have various entrepreneurial projects um for you know women in particularly in conflict zones to um and refugees to create entrepreneurial you know projects within the refugee camp because i i'm a great believer in if you can give them the skills to build a little business whether it's a shop or setting up an online business selling crafts that can change the, tra- the trajectory of that family but that community as well yeah and so um you know i really um i'm a m- huge believer in that and um one of my definite um bugbears i think is that um i'm always at nagging and i say the word nagging if you know i i used to do lots of work with facebook and i'd be in there constantly saying will you will you help me do this and they, <laughs> like so that's that's definitely my um uh that's definitely something that i'm always on a mission to try and get as much support as possible and change that trajectory for as many people as possible oh that's brilliant and it was uh, yeah it was just so lovely to hear her story in that in that moment it was lovely excellent well i'm going to let you go because you've uh, you we've taken up far too much of your time but thank you so much for being here lovely Pleasure. to speak to you lovely to talk to you too and thank you so much for having me